Today we have uh, Celia Hughes, who's our executive director, and April Sullivan, who is our uh, other uh, main audio describer. And they both are pretty much, in my uh, humble opinion, experts at what they do. Um, and this is a big part of what ArtSpark Texas also provides, which is audio description. And if you all are not on our mailing list, artsparktexas.org, you can, uh, artsparktx.org, you can sign up for our mailing list. Uh, you can also follow us on socials if you're not all already doing that, artsparktx.org. I know personally, I've been looking forward to this intro to audio description. So um, without further ado. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, we've been trying to do something around an audio description training now for a while. And uh, finally, I said to um, Susan, well, let's just do an intro a conversation about it. So a lot of people can ask their questions. We can kind of talk about what it is, um, how, uh, how we go about doing it. And then if there's interest, uh, we will then organize a training that we can do virtually for folks that are uh, interested in uh, learning more about it. But uh, uh, I thought that um, the first thing we would do is to sh play a little video to give you a sense of what it is. Now, in audio description, there are several ways that it is provided. And, um, and so in, <clears throat> in this instance, the little clip, the little movie is, it has no talking in it. So I want you to imagine what it would be like if you were blind or had uh, low vision and were watching a video that had no way for you to have access into the content of the video other than music. And so we think that, I think that this is a good example of how audio description uh, really opens up the world of visual information to people who are blind. So if you'd like to shut, close your eyes to listen to a little bit, um, but but otherwise, I just think it's a, a nice intro so that people have a sense of what is description. So take it away. Okie dokie. Thank you, April. It was hard to hear some of the sounds, the bell ringing, the dog barking, that sort of thing. Um, but I'd like to take any comments or observations about this, any questions that you might have about what you just saw, anything, uh, any kind of questions? Let me unmute people. I think I've got everybody muted. I don't know people if let you. They have to you unmute themselves. Yourself, yeah. yeah. Yep. What well, did you I, I, What did you notice about this? Go ahead, Lisa. Well, first I would say I opted to to watch it so that I could see how the descriptions fit what I was seeing. Uh, so I feel like I missed something. I almost would like to go back and do it again with my eyes shut. But it's a uh, an incredibly visual piece, and it just dawned on me that it, it would seem and the descriptor seemed rehearsed. Like it didn't seem like that's something you could do off the cuff. Right. Um, I, so I'm assuming that there are times that a script, uh, somebody doing visual descriptions would be doing it extemporaneously and then other times like this that seemed to be a little bit more rehearsed. Um, but I liked both the visuals and the descriptions at the same time. Yeah, they, well, basically, uh, for description, you preview. I mean, you've seen us come to the theater to preview, and some of us take more notes than other others, but when you're doing live description sitting in a theater, you can't read notes because you have to be watching all the time, and then you have to just be in the flow of describing what's happening as it's happening. But you've... you've um, previewed it, you've read the script, hopefully, and you know what you're going to say. Um, but when you're doing a video like this and you have to fit it into a certain number of seconds, 
uh, you script it out and it is recorded. And so in a way it is rehearsed. Um, but April, what you take more notes when you do live theater. So you want to talk a little, well, we can, let's get some more comments about what yeah. people and what they thought. Did anybody notice anything about the little girl? You could also type into the chat if you're having trouble with unmute or anything it was like fine. that. So when did you realize that, Silva? When she was touching the hole on the on the fence, the way she was feeling it with her hands. So she, the little girl was blind. So. You know, every time I watch this, I use this a lot. I always see, I always gain a new insight into this little film. Um, so did it, did it, anyone else notice that she was blind? And what other kinds of things were going on in the film that would give you the sense that maybe she was blind? I mean, most of those were visual, unfortunately, it, it, but we tried. Toby, did you have a sense that the little girl was blind? Um, no, I could, the sound kind of went in and out sometimes, so I couldn't always hear everything. Okay. Um, but it, I got the sense that she was kind of carefree, and you know, she just seemed like I would hear like, "Oh, she now has a wand." And like she's walking her dog, and you know she's very playful, kind of things like that. So it's like I miss the blindness aspect, but also like I got the sense she was using it kind of like a staff for a cane, but right. more like she was just being like a little girl and doing little girl things. And so the sense of playfulness was that the description of the like the fish bus and the animal you know the people with animal heads and things like that was did that give you a sense of playfulness i think it was the scene and um and yeah being the i think it was more like oh it's this is a little girl and like it met my expectations okay. of like what she was okay. doing okay okay yeah I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I did. I was uh, I was washing dishes when you <laughs> called on me. <laughs> Sorry. Alrighty. So anyone else have any questions? Okay, go ahead. I was gonna say I think once the little girl gets the wand, it any anything magical could happen when a little girl has a wand. So you know it's gonna go in some direction of that way. Anyone else have questions about why she described things the way she did or taking I, time? I have. So I was wondering, like, um, I'm trying to find a good word for this, so apologies <laughs> already. It, because I went between closing my eyes and looking and listening. So I would go close my eyes, just listen, and I would open my eyes and listen and i also enjoyed doing like when i when i had my eyes open and i saw and i heard i think it was very rich but when i closed my eyes i felt i feel like she was very mon monot is that the word you do you know what i'm talking which monotone monotone well monotone monotone yeah monotone and she didn't sort of ex uh, uh, um explain any expressions or didn't have any it was very cut and dry. Right, right. I, I wonder if that's the kind of, is there, are there different ways of describing? Is there more like a, you know, painting a picture and giving very artistic experience? And is there some people just do very cut and dry sort of explanation? That's a good that was what I was wondering. We'll talk about that in a little while. Susan, you wanted to say something? Okay, so I had to really kind of come around to this after, and especially when Silva started talking about this. This audio description was done for adults, not for children. I don't know. 
I mean, it seems like if it was being done for children, that maybe some of the words, they would not have used some of the descriptions that they used. Could be. Yeah. That, that I, if, I felt like this was a case where the, the audio description was done for an adult audience or for at least over the age of 10, let's say. Okay. Eight or 10. Okay. That definitely go, yeah. But I had to think about that a while. I was like, oh yeah. Okay, from the language that was used. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is Lisa. I was trying to think uh, in terms of um, what audible cues were given that she was blind. And I come to the section when she, when the dog first goes in the little hole, she doesn't notice it. And then they, the descriptors talks about the breeze and she's feeling around the edges. and my able-bodied, good-sighted person said, well, duh, you can see it. Uh, and that was me saying, okay, there's something. It didn't, it didn't hit the consciousness of her being blind, but that was one of the clues. Right, right. And when she walks smack into the fence, that should be a little bit of a clue too, but your first thought is, oh, well, she doesn't pay attention, you know? And then she feels around and then you start to get a sense. Any other any other observations about things that were described or the way they were described? I do have a question. When they when the when we got to the credits, the descriptor did not. I mean, they were in a uh, Asian language. I'm assuming Japanese, but she didn't read the credits. Right. Yeah, and that that is a a thing in movies now. More about credits, but. Credits just fly by, you know, but but as more and more films are being described, um, there's more and more attention being t paid to credits and what gets described, what gets read and all of that sort of thing. So, yeah, on this one, she just did the uh, she just did the, the what the pictures were. So, Callie. Yeah, actually, it's Collie. Um, um, that's OK. Brian's um, Collie. <laughs> Um, what I'm wondering is, you know, there weren't any words to that story. So how, how, I mean, you'll probably cover this, but how do you integrate the descriptive words with the, you know, conversational or, you know, the, the descriptive words that are already in a book, or do you just not describe if the book is describing it? Because I know it's like picture books with, um, you know, for little kiddos, they often leave all the description up to the pictures. Like right. it's the it's the illustrator's job to show that, and then the author is you know doing the words, and it, I'm just curious about if that made any sense. Right. So April, do you want to answer that using the how do we integrate into the dialogue? Well, I was a little confused with the question because you were talking about books. So are you talking about if you were to describe pictures in a book? Either one, if it's with a movie or you know. Or I was thinking, oh, there, well, um, you know, you go to YouTube and there's a lot of books that are being read by people. Right. So it kind of puts it into a movie kind of a form. So you are Cause talking I, about... Because I do, yeah, because I do have visually impaired students. Right. And so you're, you are yeah. talking more about books. Well, you know, the, the words are not going to give you the description of the pictures. So you, right. have, to, you have to give a description of the picture. Um, it, especially to highlight whatever is important to understand the words, to have a better comprehension of what the picture book is saying or what the author is trying to say or that, that sort of thing. Okay. So, um, so on this particular, so April, do you have, I, I, do you have something to, because I was thinking I was, of talk, talking about. To, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I was just thinking in answer to Kali's question, maybe are you uh, maybe you're asking if you are reading a picture book to a group of students, how would you integrate the uh, audio description of the pictures into that story? Would you make it kind of seamless where it's almost part of the story, like you're the storyteller, you're reading the, the words, then also describing the pictures as the storyteller? And, and that's 
and that goes back to what Silva was saying about the monotony of the audio describer, because a lot of times the audio describer is trying to make sure to differentiate themselves from the uh, the dialogue so that it's obvious when it's description versus the characters. But I think in something like reading a book, you could definitely, you're the storyteller, because it, it is it's just a, words on paper and pictures on paper, so you could become the whole storyteller of that book. I mean, a lot of people already do that anyway when they read to their kids, they kind of make up what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so you make a decision in the in the reading of the book, you make the decision if you have to describe the picture before the words or if you describe the picture after the words, and that can change from page to page uh, in terms of how it is the flow of the book going. And so sometimes you may have to set up what's happening on the page. And I'm sure you do this already when you're reading to, you know, you have to set up what's on the page and then give the words, or sometimes you give the words in suspense and then add the picture. So it really goes to how the flow of the book is. But April's right. When we're, when we're describing uh, static images, like in a museum or something like that, um, you can take a little bit more um, liberty in how you describe and put more tone and color into your voice. Um, they they try to say in movies and in theater, you know, that we are the invisible um, service. We're not supposed, you know, we're not, the, the people didn't come to the theater so they could hear April and I describe, you know, they came to the theater so they could see the dance or see the play. And we're just there to make it that much more accessible to them in terms of translating what's, what, you know, or narrating what's, visually happening on the stage and so the rule of thumb has always been to keep your voice you know you you have to keep your voice in a, in a different range or a different level tone than what's happening but you also have to match somewhat what's happening because if there's a fight scene on the stage and and the person who is blind is hearing all this racket and commotion and people punching each other and everything and the describer is going they're fighting he punches him you know it's not it kind of takes the it, you, the idea is to not take the person out of the play so you have to because once they are taken out of the scene then they have a hard time finding their way back in again so you have to keep them with the flow of what's happening and that's why the language that you choose is really important um what you describe is really important because if you if you describe something that's not essential to the scene then you've lost your viewer because they're trying to figure out what the hell you just talked about and what does it have to do with what's going on and now something is you know a scene has already passed and they can't ever get that back they can't go back and try to figure it out so that's why you have to preview and really um figure out what is what are the essential elements of this scene what are the essential elements in order to enhance understanding of the scene of the play of the whatever it is that what that you're describing so the thing that i love about this video and and today i had another moment where i was like oh um you know to me when she picked when she she's the world is colorful then her purse is stolen and her dog runs after the the robber and and she can't see anymore and so because that's her dog who leads her around so then she you know runs into the fence and so when she goes into the fence and enters darkness she's basically entered her blindness because she has no access. Then she finds the twig and that becomes her access because as you notice, as she hits it on the wall, things come to life. And so that's what it's like to use a cane. When, you, when you're a cane user and you're walking along and you touch something with the cane, you know what it is, or you, you, know, you know that there's something there. And then you explore it and it comes into view what it is. And so that's what's happening in this movie is that she touches something, she comes to a brick wall, it's not until she smells the bread that she knows she's at a bread shop. 
and that's when it comes up on the wall. So it's a wonderful little uh, depiction of, to me, what I think of access, you know, how you, how you gain information through your, you know, your adaptive, your cane, your dog, whatever it is that you use. And, and then, of course, when the dog comes back, she drops her wand, it becomes a stick again. And, and, and also, it's her wonderful imagination of what the world is like. You know, she touches things and it's all these crazy buildings and crazy buses and, and you know, blimps flying overhead, which are all of her imagination, you know, of what she hears and what she imagines them to be to look like. And then of course, when she gets the dog back, then it becomes reality again. Then she's back on that street, walking down the street. So I think in many ways, it's just a wonderful little glimpse into, into blindness um, or, or, you know, or into what, you know, what a sighted person would imagine blindness might be. And, uh, and I, of course, April and I would differ on this. I, of course, would describe a lot more. Yeah, if you ever hear me describe, I would describe. There are many more things in that movie that I would describe, but but um, but I think that I always have to remind myself that the person is processing the play, the movie, and my description, and so you have to allow them time to do that process work to put the two together because you know learning. How to be a describer takes time and it's an art, but also listening to audio description takes time to learn how to do that. And your brain has to begin to learn how to take in that information and, and process it together. So, um, so you couldn't hear it very well in the movie, but that there were sounds and little things going on, like when the water dripped into the, into the, the drop of water, you could hear that. You know, so again, it's introducing that sound and then describing what it is. Um, so there are there are three things that, as a describer, um, what we there are three core skills that we have to develop uh, as a describer, and um, and not everyone can can do description. Um, everyone can be taught, but not everyone can actually be good at it. Um, and that's, you know, it's, we can't all be good at everything, right? But, uh, so, but the three core skills that we, and I served on a, on an international committee for, uh, three years while we, while we distilled down what is audio description, how do you train it, what are the skills, and, um, and that's still the training that I use today. And, um. And basically, we distilled it down into three core skills: the 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 skill to be able to observe, the skill to be able to analyze, and then to communicate. And so, you know, observation is the first one, and that's when we preview. So, April, why don't you talk a little bit about the process that you go through when you go to a play or watching one of our movies to you know to prepare? Yeah, so for a play, you really only usually get one chance to to watch it. So, and you're sitting in the dark. So I take notes in the dark. You know, I try to bring my blackest Sharpie pen so I can, if I need to find my spot, I can see it and uh, take notes. I really can't look at them or I just have to write as I watch just things that I see and then afterward go home and read them or I'll forget and type them up. And that, to me, the process of writing it and then reading it and typing it helps cement it in my mind so that I can, when I get to the show again, I won't have a chance to be looking at my notes. So they're kind of, and I read them over a couple of times so that they're in my mind and I can imagine what the scene is that's coming up that I'll be needing to say that description. Um, and it helps, we also get the script usually, and that helps a lot in terms of knowing already ahead of time by reading the script what's going to happen the um what do they call those notes between the stage, direction. stage stage direction. direction yeah so the stage directions really help cuz that's the idea of what is going to happen now the way that that specific director interprets that and does that is always going to be different but 
at least you kind of have an idea of what when you're going to be seeing something important happen on the stage and that's the things that you want to be writing down and and knowing when those are going to happen so that when it does happen and with plays since things can be revised over the run of the show something different may happen you know somebody might be in a different spot than they were earlier in the week just because that worked better for the show so you always do have to be looking at the stage to know what's going to when something happens so that you can say it yeah one of the biggest frustrations for me is when i like for the touring shows when they change the cast out so i'll preview with the matinee cast and i'll describe with the evening cast so i'm all set up to describe this particular actor's um actions and behaviors and then it's a totally different actor who's doing different things so i have to be in the moment to try to catch what's happening um so that that is something you know that you, you try to watch for um and so when you observe when you go you, like april said you read the script you have a sense of what if you can you have a sense for what is happening and the important things that you have to look for where you know where are the things that I've got to watch how they do this, but and I I take notes too, but not not I mean and I'll have a note paper and I'll write really I'll write on a piece of paper so I'll go through a whole pad of paper or in my notebook I'll go through like 20 pages to take yeah. you know six notes because I'll write on a page and then I turn the paper because inevitably I don't know where I wrote and I'll write right over it again and you know and and so it uh, at intermission i'll read my notes and make sense of what my notes are and then at the end i'll read my notes and then like for a set because we describe the sets that's the first thing you do is describe the set to the person i'll draw a picture i just draw a, a line drawing of what the set is and label it so that when i go home i can type up my description of what the set is in a logical way so that a person who is blind can follow me around from either right to left or left to right or top to bottom or big to you know from you know general to specific but it, but i so i draw that because if i waste my time trying to write the set then then i don't have time to really focus on what's happening in the play for the action then after you do that, after you get your your observation, your inventory of actions and things like that, then you have to analyze it. And and to analyze it is to uh, to think about the entire event, think about the whole play, and what are the things that I observe? Do I have to describe in order to move that? move my patron along to get to the same end that everyone else gets to because that's what you want you want your patron to laugh at the same time you want them to um to walk out and say that director had no idea what they were doing that's the worst play i've ever seen or you know what a wonderful in, in you know in, inventive ours is not to be judgmental ours is just to say what it is we see this is what we see, this is what is happening. It's not to say, you know, this is wonderful or marvelous, or, you know, you have to be very careful with your wording, that you're not, you're not leading the audience member to a particular end. You need, the point is that the audience member arrives at their own opinion as to whether or not they liked it, whether or not they understood it, that sort of thing. So you have to analyze it, and sometimes in some plays and in a lot of movies, lots of information goes by that we don't describe because we just can't. Uh, when you're describing in between the dialogue, because that's one of the things that we didn't talk about, when people are talking, you don't talk over them. So you have to, the other thing that you're observing is where, where am I going to be able to say this? Where is there a pause in the dialogue? Where is there a break in the act in the you know in what's happening verbally where I can fit something in? And so you have to make really hard choices sometimes to let things go by because you can't describe them, you don't have time, 
or you know sometimes you'll have main action happening and then you've got this wonderful back action you know happening that you can't describe because you don't have the time and you can't you don't have time to set it up you know unless unless it's like a commedia dell'arte or something like that and you can set it up ahead of time that this is what's going to be happening so you have to make those choices go, go ahead April. i was thinking of like uh the little mermaid i think it was the musical um the, a scene when i don't know the little mermaid that well it's been many years since i saw it but those who know it probably know uh there's like a huge ta dinner table and i think the chef maybe is chasing the crab around or the lobster and there's just all this action going on i think somebody else is chasing somebody else and there's all this food on the table and, and so much action but you really have to I was like, I can't describe all of this. There's too much. So I had to think about what would get me and the and the viewers to the point where I think the lobster pop, they open the lid and he pops out and he chops his head off or something. I don't know what happens, but something happens at the end there. That's kind of the climax of that scene. So you have to make sure that you're following the action that will get you to that point where when it happens at the end, you're setting that up. So it's like when, when I described Hamilton, um, there's a lot, for those of you who have seen Hamilton, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on and this, you know, the, the, the ensemble cast that creates so much of what's being said through action and, and through dance. And, um, and so I had to make a really difficult decision that I wasn't going to really describe any of that because it was, it's just nonstop uh, content. I mean, you know, the, 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 and so, so I, I set up in the beginning in my pre-show notes, I, I set up what was happening. I described what the movements were. I described that they were, uh, you know, echoing of the content that they were, you know, that sometimes they foreshadowed what was happening. So I got all of that set up and then I could refer to it you know when i went through my description i could say the dancers are passing a letter they pass from person to person to person to person so i didn't have to i didn't have to go into a lot of detail about what that was because i had already set it up ahead of time that this was the theatrical um form that they had taken for this so and so like april said a lot of times you know in a musical or in something you've got all all kinds of action going on a lot of times you just have to stay with your leads you know you just stay with your leads or you have to know where it's going so that again like april said you you stay with them so you can take them and everybody arrives at the end at the same point and unfortunately you haven't described all of the chaos that's on the on the stage or on the screen but you you can't uh and and plus it wouldn't make a lot of sense, I don't think, if we were, you know, if you know, for us as sighted people, we have this wonderful uh, conceit that our brain can take in so much information and process it in a nanosecond, and we don't even have to think about it. It just goes into the brain, and we've got it all figured out. And so, if you actually stopped and tried to describe all of that and have it make sense and pull it all together, it would take you ten minutes. You know, um, so we just we don't unfortunately we just don't have that kind of time. So that's to analyze. So analyze it within the context of what you're doing, and that this is true for anything. We do a lot of work now with educational materials. April's been describing physics. She's going to get a degree in physics pretty soon, <laughs> and so we have to take it into the context of what what's the teacher trying to teach. And so what's this, what's the visual information that's not getting carried over to, you know, to the, our viewer, the visual information that they need to know in order to understand the concept that the teacher is teaching. So the last core skill is communication. And so, as we said, in most description, you've only got a limited amount of time to say something. So you've got to know how to say it with the, the most concise way possible. And, you know, you know, unless you're describing a long scene, a long dance scene, uh, you can speak in complete sentences. 
but many, many times in theater, we, we speak in phrases. Sometimes you can only get one word in, you know, but it's important. That word is important, so you have to get it in, you know. So again, as you do your analysis and you, like April takes her notes, but I'm sure she doesn't say exactly how she wrote it when she says it, because she thinks about what, what, how you want to say it, right? Right, yeah, I'm just taking the quickest notes I can take to get, because it's all happening so fast, just to get the idea so that when I think back on it, I can think of the best way to say that with the time I have. And so part of communication is also your voice, your tone, your language, the age of the viewer. So that's all part of communication. Uh, we just did a film last week. Uh, uh, it was an installation piece. It was a musical piece and it was an animation with no dialogue. But the first, I don't know, three minutes of the film were these every, all these artist rooms and everything was covered in cobwebs. And so, you know, so to me, cobweb is a negative. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of like a Halloweeny, dark and scary. So, and that was not the, that was not the mood that the videographer was going for, that the artist was going for. So we had to think of how are we going to describe these, you know, this net, this lace, but we had to describe it over and over again for three minutes. So you, you know, in all different contexts. So you don't want to say the same thing over and over and over again you know and i have to say that uh just i'm still i wake up in the morning and i think oh i could have said it that way oh i could have said it that way so i still think of ways that i could say things that would have been more to me more evocative to try to evoke within my viewer what this thing on the screen is you know and so you you have to think about your language um, how are you creating that image for someone? Um, and you have to also remember that the director has made specific choices. The director has hired a set designer, has hired a lighting designer, has hired a costume designer. You've got sound design. So all of that is part of the experience. And so the describer's job is, is to allow that also to come through. So that's why you don't have nonstop description because you've got to allow the music to come through. But if there's a dramatic lighting change, you describe that uh, because, you know, 90% of people who are blind are not totally blind. Uh, a lot of people have lost their sight. Uh, uh, they, so they've had sight. So those people are, are really picky patrons because they know what they're missing. So they want to know what's on that stage. Um, so you really have to take that into consideration. Plus, they will, they could sense a change in light from light to dark, you know, those kind of things. So you have to take those into consideration also while you're describing. So you're not just watching the action of the actors, but you're actually watching the action of the environment, of the atmosphere, of what's been, what has been created on the stage. So I've talked a lot, as usual. <laughs> so any any questions? But those are the three things. And April wrote a really good blog um, about her process and what she goes through to uh, do audio description. Um, and it, hers is not. I mean, this is not unique to April. I mean, we all do this. But I thought she's done a. a she did a good job of sort of just saying the steps that she goes through. But so any questions of anything that has popped up for you? Yes. The one question I have is, uh, and it came to light when you started mentioning Hamilton, if you are not speaking over the performers, you take a show like Hamilton, I can't think of a time where there was a lull in the action, in the, in the speaking and singing long enough to describe it, anything. How do you do that, or do you just sit back and watch yourself? Well, there, there, there were enough lulls that I could get things in. 
And for Hamilton, we had I had the script, so I printed out all 140 pages or 190 pages for hours of work. And um, and so I I I skimmed it before the show because, and then I went to the show, and then I sat down and I read the whole thing, and I wrote into the script. Um, what I was going to say in between each action and where things were. And then I, I tabbed my script so that, um, so that when I was in one, as soon as I got into one scene, I moved my script to the next tab so that I already knew what the next scene was, because I don't remember anymore what's going to be happening from scene to scene to scene. And so that way I was able to always be aware of, watching what was happening on this on the stage and describing what I needed to describe but I had already glanced down and I knew what the next thing was so that I could set up the scene in those nanoseconds that go on setting up scene to scene but you can get a lot of stuff in in just a few seconds you can say a lot in just a few seconds so but that's what you have to do and that's it you, you have to just watch and and um and that's why some things go by. They don't get described because you just you just can't describe them, you know. Toby, you had a question? Are you washing the dish again, Toby? I'm okay. sorry. I, I was in the settings when you asked. <laughs> I was going to say um <clears throat> so when you when you say you describe that the ninety percent of people with blindness are aren't fully blind. That's correct. But you're describing for other people with visual disabilities as well. Like, is that true? Like, people with TBIs or, um, for example, or whoever needs it. Yeah, I mean, we describe we're describing visual action. So. We've Just learned, to expand on like the types of people who would use your service. Yeah, re recently it's been it's been uh, pretty much uh, talked about that people with autism uh, like to use uh, audio description because it helps them know where to look, what's important. It helps them to determine what's important in the scene. It helps them know where to look, how to follow. So, um, so yeah, there are a lot of other people that are who are using audio description for that reason, because not everybody is, I mean, I describe people that are sighted will listen and they'll say, well, I didn't even see that, you know, so you're, you're trained as a visual, you know, as a sighted person, you look what you think what's interesting as a describer, we look at everything. So we see what's happening in the background. You don't necessarily have seen that because you're not looking at it, you know? But we're trained to look at everything. What's happening, because we don't tell we don't tell somebody, be careful, pay attention to this, because in the next scene, this is gonna be important. But we have to know that if this is gonna be important in the next scene, we have to set it up in the prior scene. So we have to be able to describe it, but, but it's to just place it. So if there's, if somebody's gonna, shoot somebody with a gun then we have to make sure that we place the gun in the room or if he slips something into his pocket we have to make sure that we slip that into his pocket so we have to be aware of what's ha what's coming so that we set it up ahead of time because we can't set it up in the moment and with your words yeah with like two words so that's mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the hardest things <laughs> I find new describers. That's a, a classic problem with all new describers, is they either want to tell you the story, they'll tell you the plot of the story, or they'll tell you what you're hearing. Uh, and you know, we're all like, you know, don't say the phone rings when the phone rings. But of course, now you have to because everybody's rings are so different, you know. But but it's like it's knowing that you know, that uh, something is going to happen. And so you've got to know where do I, if it's been foreshadowed, where do I put that in there to do the foreshadowing? And um, I learned this um, a long time ago. I was describing a, a, a 
this show. And, um, and it took place in one room and there was a staircase that led up to the other, to the second floor. And this guy had gone upstairs to go to bed. And then this couple that had just met started making out underneath the Christmas tree. And then all of a sudden, the guy that had gone upstairs jumped up from behind a table and it was pointing at, I don't remember what he was doing, but it scared, you know, it scared me. I was like, where did he come from? Because the last <laughs> time I saw him was he had gone upstairs, you know? And so I couldn't preview it again. It was in San Antonio. So I just had made a mental note to myself that I had to be really observant after he went up the stairs to know when he came back down the stairs and fell asleep on the table, on the chair behind the table. Because, I mean, it, it startled me. And, and the, the reality is maybe they didn't want me to see that. Maybe they wanted me to be totally fixated on the couple that was making out. But I, you know, but I did, you know, I did notice, oh, he snuck back down the stairs and went to sleep. So I just said that, you know, and then jumped out it was still startling in the in the in the play um but i had at least you know paid attention to putting him on that bench so that he could jump jump up from the bench and so you know it's those kind of things that you have to as an as a audio describer you learn to really take in visual information um all the time you know uh, much more so than than most sighted people do, I think. Which uh, can get annoying when you're just trying to watch television. <laughs> it starts running through your head. <laughs> well, I, you know, people when I first started doing this, people would go to the movies with me and they'd say, "How would you describe this scene?" And I would try, and then finally I said, "You know, I'm not working." You know, so if I'm observing a play or a movie to be a describer, I look at it very differently than if I'm going to just enjoy. And, uh, and so, you know, and so it hasn't ruined my theater going pleasure. <laughs> but, you know, but it's, but it's always, it's really, really, really important to preview and take your notes and prepare your notes. And I will say the very first movie I ever described was Kung Fu Panda. I remember that. Uh, yes, and it was for a sibling group from the Texas School for the Blind. So it was kids who were blind and their brothers and sisters. And uh, for several of these families, it was the first time the family had ever gone to the movies together as a family because we were providing audio description. And um, I, I, worked on that my description for 30 hours i spent 30 hours preparing for that description because i had to describe i had to describe uh, kung fu moves and plus i was dirt nervous it was the first movie i had ever described you know so you know now i'm better but i can still i mean that that film that we did last week I, you know, April did it first. So this is how we do a lot of it. Now, April will look at it. She'll get the timing down. She'll capture the, you know, what she sees and that sort of thing. Then she kicks it to me and I look at it and edit it. And so uh, how, how long did it take you? It was an eight minute film, April. How long do you think you spent on it? Probably at least two hours. Okay. And then I spent eight. Uh, on an eight minute film. Now the thing is, I was being very um, anal because it was it's it's on YouTube now and it's out to the world. So you know, and I and I'm not happy with it. There are things I wish I had said differently, but you know, but it, you know, so so Lisa, I'm sorry I don't spend eight hours preparing for one of ground floor theaters, uh, <laughs> but I probably you know I read the script and preview it and write my notes and. You know, so it probably works out to about that much when you think about the time you put in to uh, actually go write your notes and describe it. <clears throat> so comments, any other comments or questions? Uh, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Toby. Okay. I just had kind of a nosy um, 
curiosity and I just wondering about your fatigue level. You know, if you're doing something like Hamilton, it's long. And, um, you know, I know like, you know, assigning, you know, they'll, you know, we'll take alternate in things. Do you, do you do things like that or do you go from start to finish? Um, we did that just in the finish. opera. When we were describing opera, we haven't done that in a while. We would have someone do the first act and someone do the second act. Because in the opera, you are also reading the super titles. So you're reading the super titles and giving descriptions. So it is nonstop talk through the opera. So we did do, you know, we did do that. Um, but uh, it's, it's mentally fatiguing, but for me, it's not until it's over, you know. At, when I come home, no matter what it is, when I come home and not after doing a description, I'm up for pretty much the rest of the night because my brain is just firing, you know, because I've been so alert, paying attention. But uh, and in movies, um, uh, it's usually the same voice because it gets confusing. You want your listener, if you change voices or change people, then it gets confusing for the listener i would you know we did that um we we, de we described the cleveland sign stage so it was a sign interpreted performance and they had they had the actors who was so it was a integrated ca cast of deaf and hearing actors but they had the deaf actors were not voiced by the same actor the deaf actors were voiced by whoever was close to them so talk about confusing because people who are blind associate a character or associate something with the voice so when you don't have the voice you know we had to i had to continually interject who was speaking because there was no continuity of the voice with the actor so it's little things like that that make it interesting monique i had a question yeah, I'm curious. Um, so you shared your, I guess, method of doing the description and prepping for a, a visual for a play or some sort of performance or a movie. And I'm curious about, um, I work in an art museum, so my job every day is to describe, to do close looking experiences. Um, I'm obviously working 99% with um, sight, with no impairment, but we're still working on those facilitation skills of like that close looking. Um, I do work with a group of onset, um, early onset dementia patients, and so this is the most similar for me that there still is, there is some visual impairment and some perception. Um, so I have to be really mindful about the way I'm describing something, but also where I start and what's going to be my focal. I'm curious when you're working with a still image um, or a work of art, where is your start? When you have a plane or movie, you have your beginning, middle, and end. When you have this image that has so much going on, how do you as the describer decide where in this work are you going to start and how do you expand them through this image and then end it? Just curious if you um, it's pretty have your much, own method for that. It's pretty much the same process is, 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 that a docent goes through or whoever is creating your, your, the talk for your docent tour, it's pretty much the same process in that it depends on painting to painting. It depends on uh, piece to piece. If if you need to, um, I like to say in art that you tell them where they're going first and then take them there. So you set the, you set up the scene first. This is, you know, this is a, a street in Paris in the 1930s. So they ha already know where they're going. And then you can either start with that really general and work down to a specific, or you can start with maybe if there's something in the painting uh, that is really, that stands out or is the main focal point of the pick painting, then you start there and build it out. Um, the main thing about paintings is, and pictures is to be really um, logical in the way that you describe it so that you don't jump them all around the painting. So if they're, if you say, okay, right, this is a night, you know, this, a street in Paris in the nighttime in the 1940s, you know, you're going to say the streets are cobblestone. So then you start at the bottom of the painting 
So then don't jump them up to the top of the painting and say the moon is shining because that, you know, then it's jumping them around. So you want to just make sure that wherever you start, then you build it up to, you know, so that you can end and say, and the moon, you know, shines down upon this scene or something like that. So just make sure that you remember that you logically take them through. And, um, and I find that most uh, text that docents write, um, it just takes a little bit of uh, looking at what, what people are saying about the painting and then looking at the painting and saying, oh, well, this needs to be described. We need to give a little bit more information here to give the feel of this particular painting, you know, or of this particular image, if it's a photograph or something like that. Um, you do uh, read the, the, uh, anything that's on the label. So you do give the title and the, uh, the artist and the, uh, the medium. Um, and if there's any text, you do give that, you do read that also. Go ahead, Monique. That's, I was gonna say that's funny because that's the first thing I tell, <laughs> don't read the label. Um, <laughs> but you're right, when I work with my, when I work with um, the, uh, the, my participants with early memory loss, that's actually the first thing that I'll do is um, find some foundation and ground them with, right. um, with what we're, we're, it actually adds a sense of comfort um, instead of some anxiety of what is this? So right. uh, yes, right. I do the opposite. For <laughs> yeah, and I always say, you know, painters have been so uh, uh, helpful when they name their paintings Untitled 1, Untitled 2. So, so, you know, if that's, you know, sometimes if that's the name of the painting, I'll wait until the end. But if the name of the painting grounds us and what we're looking at, then I'll give it first. You know, that really, there is no rule of hard and fast rule on that in terms of whether you give it first or last. But it's always it's always helpful to give them a sense of the size, what they're looking at. Um, and then also to direct their eyes, direct their gaze around the painting so that they, they know what they're looking at. You know, if the if the painting has, a you know, is a really dark color, but it's got one bright, color then you identify that and maybe that's where you start you know so it's it, it you it, it the most important thing is to just be logical in how you describe and don't give too much you know don't, and a, a lot of museums and i'm sure you guys are even doing this are now introducing scents and sounds to try to add a little bit more dimension to uh, to the experience so you might want to think about that if you haven't done that like a Paris scene at night, they'd play a little song from Paris to just give a flavor of that or, or touch, you know, hand around some things, some textures. Yes. Uh, you can you have, you have bring the palette knife and that sort of thing so they get a sense of what how rough the painting is. So ta uh, tactile experiences are really important too. And they all go with audio description. I think that that just enhances the description is if you can give them some other senses to to uh, to explore at the same time. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Seems to be 810, so we might want to wrap it up. Yep. Any last questions? Can I squeeze one in? Yes, sir. OK. I wondered. Um, if there's an interdisciplinary uh, aspect to like to your audio description, because I know like there's a big focus in theater on like movement, and so in in dancing it's it's all it can be all silent, and so it's easier to describe that, and then you kind of work up to theater where there's a lot of action and movement and describe that. And then film where it's like um, where it's fixed, but it's very fast paced. So do you have um, methods for going about for each of these? Do you divide it for um, for each of these specific? Maybe you answer this before, but um, for each branch in arts part. Do we, um, let me understand your question. Do we 
break it up do, between different describers for different media? Yeah. Do you, between the different branches, do you like partition it up, or is it just one fixed method for all the different disciplines? Uh, well, it's it's the three core skills for all, mm -hmm. no matter what you're describing. Um, even in art, you're observing, you're taking an inventory, you're determining what's important, and then you're communicating it. So that the three core skills are the same no matter what you do. Um, but moving into the different dis different disciplines, it's very different. Uh, describing dance is very complex um, mm -hmm. uh, to make it meaningful and interesting. Um, Whereas theater gives you a lot. Theater gives you dialogue and it gives you, you know, sound design and, it, you know, that, so it gives you more um, than, than dance does. So, and then movies give you too much, you know, so in movies you're having to really pair back. So, so yes, each different, each discipline takes a different kind of um, approach, yeah. uh, but okay. it's, Still the same core skills. I have one one quick question. Um, you know, if if I am, I would like to start describing my art when I post it on social media. Is there a format? Like, do I put it in parentheses and say descriptive text, or what's? I think that uh, I think that we already do that. So, what is the what is the standard, uh, Susan or? Gina or April? Um, this, this is Gina. I can I can answer that. Um, so so normally with the, um, writing an image description online, there are two things that that um, you can do. One that's important is including the image description, a short one, in the alt text of the image, and then a second one is writing out image description and then colon and then a short. Um, line sometimes people get a little bit longer than that but i think one sentence should um, be sufficient in describing your your photo or artwork okay and i'll i'll look on art spark and see what you guys have been doing so, right and thank so, you so the alt text for those of you who are um is what happens when a screen reader is reading the screen and it comes to an image There'll be a, there'll be a, some kind of a, it's not a, it, there'll be brackets and in it, it'll say, you know, image 0001 or something like that. So a screen reader will read that. And so that's why in your alt text, you want to put photo of dog or something. You don't put your description in there, um, but you indicate that this is a picture of, of what it is. And, um, and then in your image description, you go into more detail and the screen reader will then pick that up and figure out if the picture is important. That's the other thing is so much stuff that we put up on our website is really not important information. It's just there to keep sighted people interested and engaged. Uh, one, I'll, I'll go ahead and not relate it to that because I, um, I think what we have talked about a lot with those descriptions is yeah shorter is better and it's not always easy to describe it an abstract because i'm familiar with your work and and so things like maybe bright colors or a center dot or that kind of thing that you know that you can kind of ground your description works on a totally other note um Celia, or it was April, mentioned that April had written a really good blog this week about audio description. So if you want to go visit our website, uh, it has a link in both English and Spanish of the recent uh, piece, the art piece, the video electronica music art piece that they worked on together. And I think that you all did a really great job on it. And I think you all will enjoy going to watch that. So if you go to our website, artsparktx.org, and then go to our blogs, the, the new audio description blog, and that link will be on there that you all can see. And I uh, put it in the chat too. Okay, oh, great, good. Some of my name, chat appeared, okay. The name of the piece is Cool Cool. cool. 
which is unripened fruit. Um, so it, it's basically seven musicians from around the country and the world uh, performed uh, music in their, what they call it, their confinement spaces. And so it's very interesting. It's nice music. Yeah, and it we we did it because because the uh, it was the Americas Society was our client, and they work with South American countries. We did it both in Spanish and in English. Alrighty, well I guess we've worn everybody out. Um, so this is just a little idea of what description is and uh, how we go about doing it and why April and I are so insistent that we preview. <laughs> <laughs> because it's hard, you know, you can't do it in the moment, you know, and you have to train yourself to speak as you're watching. You have to train yourself to say it as it's happening. And that's not natural, that doesn't come natural to, to, you know, to us. So it's, it is something that you have to be trained and practiced to do. I have a question. Um, how long have you and how long has April been doing audio description and how long did it take you to get to the point where it was coming pretty naturally? Well, I started doing description in about 2000, so it's been 20 years and it still doesn't come naturally. I mean, I still have to work at it. Yeah. When did I start doing it? Maybe 2010, eight, something like that. I don't remember. I, you went to a, a you went to a training. Remember, you and uh, Mary Torkelson went to a training. Uh, so yeah, I think you've been doing it for about 12 years, 12 or 13. I've been going to I've been going to training since probably '96 when we first started doing audio description here in Austin because I was working for Access Arts Office. So I was witnessing audio description and definitely never brave enough to do it for a very, very long time. It takes a lot of listening to it, watching it, practicing it, and getting it in your brain that this actually can happen. These words can come out of my mouth <laughs> while somebody else is singing or right after somebody sings and before they start talking or because that's a a lot to get that your brain to actually do that. Yeah, so, yeah, so we twelve years we, now. People get trained and uh and and if they really want to do it after they go through the training, you know, then they start to do equipment. This is the process. They start to take equipment to the theater and they listen to the describer and then eventually uh we have them write pre show notes and then eventually one day I'll just say, Oh, you're gonna describe this because no describer will ever say, I'm ready to do it now. So I just have to say, okay, Lisa, you're going to do that. You're going to do this show. And you're like, oh, okay. And then you do it, you know. <laughs> and then we, we provide, uh, we provide uh, somebody is always listening. The equipment person is always listening. So we give feedback uh, and, and do a lot of uh, uh, technical assistance, mentoring for as long as we feel you need it you know, until uh, you feel comfortable and you're really on your own. Well, thank you guys. We will try to do a training. Is anybody here want to do a training outside of the staff? <laughs> I was going to say me. <laughs> but if you know of anybody in your company or, you know, anybody that, that you think might be a good describer, we, we now, one of the things that's keeping us afloat during COVID is description. Uh, we're doing lots and lots of educational videos, like April said, physics. But don't mm -hmm. let that scare you off. We've done all kinds of movies. We've done uh, commercials. What was that? Commercials. Yeah, we do a lot of commercials. We do. Um, yeah, we do it every day. It's a new. It's a new day when we open up our inbox and see what they want us to describe. Um, so, um, and that's easier because that's static. We're just writing it. Uh, and then we send the script in and the company has an automatic system that it just reads it. So we're not, that the, the live description is what scares most people. 
to actually have to go in and do a live description, but like, but uh, for movies and things like that, it's not live. You're just, you're scripting it out. So it's a little bit easier. You, you have a little bit uh, more time to kind of work through things and think about things. All righty. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. It's good to see you all. Thank so you. Much, you all. Bye. Thank you to our funders, Texas Commission on the Arts, St. David's Foundation, Cultural Arts City of Austin, National Endowments for the Arts Creative Forces, Austin Public Library, and Donald D. Hamill Foundation.